Jade, in a way of putting both readings together. We see first Samuel being called by the Lord, having already entered the service of Eli, the high priest of the temple. He's now being called by the Lord, but has not yet recognized him. It takes a few times before, well, first Eli intervenes and realizes what's happening and explains it to Samuel. And Samuel gets called by the Lord four times before Samuel understands fully what is happening. But it's the Lord calling Samuel, simply calling him by name and Samuel answering, here I am. And finally with the response that he Eli gives him, speak Lord, your servant is listening. You see there's a slight resistance there, not, in, not through the fault of Samuel, he didn't know. He had to learn, but he resisted, he was learning. Then we see on the, on the side of the gospel, and we come to the gospel, and our Lord is beginning his public ministry here, and here he enters the house of Simon, who would become Peter, and his brother Andrew, together with two other brothers, James and John. Not the brothers of Simon and Andrew, but they're two, those two are also brothers. In any case, and he heals Simon's Peter-in-law, then uh, Simon's brother-in-law, Simon's mother-in-law, sorry. But then he goes out and begins healing the sick, who are bringing them, they're all bringing, they've already heard of, this, of the healings of some of the others that our Lord had already started. We saw yesterday that of the deliverance from a spirit, from an evil spirit. So they're hearing, people are knowing, they're bringing their sick to get healed by the Lord. If we knew there was somebody who could just reach out and say, here I will it be healed, we'd probably all running too. In any case, what does our Lord respond when the others come? First our Lord goes to a deserted place and he goes to pray, which he does frequently in the gospel. Right? It reminds us we all need some time each day. We should go apart uh, silently with our Lord and pray. But in any case, how does our Lord respond when the disciples come to him? Lord, everybody's looking for you. He said, well, let us go from here. I must go elsewhere. Let's go on to the nearby villages. Let's, there I can permit that I may preach there also. So he's going elsewhere. He's going out, reaching out. Not just in one area, but everywhere. And what he's pointing out here is that, and this is what needs to be learned, this is what Samuel has to learn, it's not about myself. I can't be seeking myself, particularly if I'm being called to the service of the Lord. But it's about living for Jesus. I must go out and give, my, give myself. So what I have to do. And our Lord did nothing less. Doing good, as I once heard him once long ago. We went about doing good. At least for, the, well, for these three years, in this public ministry, he went about doing good. Now we see by the healing of all the sick. And he went about preaching the gospel. That he was now, this is what he had come for. In fact, I think he says it. All he does is that that's the purpose for which I've come, to preach, to give the gospel, to bring salvation to all people, to show them the way. So it's about following and living for Jesus. And in a certain sense, every one of us is called to that, one way or another even if we never leave our homes, but we're still called. If I'm leaving a, leading a holy life, I'm going to be careful because we are seen, we are watched. We are evangelizing by giving a good example. You see, then we're, we're, we're preaching the gospel. We are evangelizing, we are witnessing, one way or another. So we're all called, one way or another, each according to the, our way of life, but our state of life, but we're all called. So we have to seek, not for ourselves, because in the end, we're not taking anything with us either. We have to, we have to recognize that. We have to, it's, a, it's right, so we have to recognize that. that. This life is not the end, and we take nothing with us. 
we have yet another life to live. And it's that life we should be preparing for, eternal life. That's the life that never ends. And in the end, there's only going to be two options. And that's another key point, because our life here is about making a choice. We have to make choices. We better make sure we're making the right choices. Because in the end, there's only going to be two options. There's either going to be union with God, heaven, or life without God, hell. And remember, it's a life that does not end. There's no end. So we have to start making those choices. Now, that's why we're here in this life. And we have to recognize it's not for ourselves. It's not about ourselves. The whole thing is God is seeking to share himself with us. We better make sure our choice, that's why God gave us a free will, we have to make the choice. He's not pushing us. He's not forcing us. He will work on us. He gives us the grace. But he's not forcing us. We have to make the choice. It's about living for him so that he can give us that grace we need and we respond to it. And if we will, he will lead us and he will take us back to himself and we will live with him for all eternity. And it will still be about living for him. Even in paradise, it will still be all our attention are focused on him, on God, not on ourselves. And I want to conclude with a little example. I was just watching a little video last night. It was on our Italian website, Franciscan Italian website, but it was a video of a, he was a young priest giving his vocation story, but it's, it's uh, too long to try to recount it all here, but I mean, but it's an amazing story. But that's exactly what he was talking about the whole way through. And one thing he reminded that he was talking to a group of high school students, one thing he reminded them, he told them, because he lived quite a life, all right, and never and frequently did not respond to the grace he was being given, quite frequently. And he kind of lived a life for himself, and that was kind of the point he was making. But one thing he begged them all throughout, particularly at the end, very adamantly begged them, two things he said, I never stopped doing. I never stopped going to Mass on Sundays, and I never stopped going to confession. And he begged them, never stop doing those things. And God will work on you, he said. Christ will work on you. And he told them this whole story, how he reached the priesthood, what brought him to it. Because he certainly had no intention of it when he was growing up. No intention. In fact, he was telling us, he was telling when he was in high school, everything was soccer, playing soccer, until it was the state championship. He was in the state champion, stamp championship. Everything depended on him. He was, he was down at the last seven seconds. He was in the defense. And here the ball was coming to the offense right there in front of the goal. And he had, the guy was ready to kick. He said, well, this is the last chance. This is it. I've got to get in there and move it. So he can't kick it in. Five, four seconds. He moved in. It bounced off his knee and went into the goal. Just rolled right into the goal. They lost it. The state championship. You can really imagine how devastated he was, and he was. In any case, I don't want to go into all the details because there's not enough time, but the point is, he, he, that was one of his shakeups, all right? In any case, shortly thereafter, with a good monsignor who was, I think, his pastor, but he was also good friends with, and another priest, had took a pilgrimage to Rome. And with a little bit of, of well, they, they kind of encouraged him to go. He didn't really have interest, but they encouraged him to go. And so did his mother, surprisingly. And he went. In fact, his mother offered to help him pay for it. So here he was going pretty much for free to Rome. With the arrangement then, afterwards, he would meet up with his mother in Barcelona. So he had to travel on his own from Rome up through France down into Spain. Okay? Now, after, while he's there in Rome, they're doing the pilgrimage, they're visiting, visiting the holy sites, and he's having a marvelous time, wonderful time. The Monsignor comes up, now we have new tickets to see the Pope. 
They're going to have to get to go to this two of the group are going to get to go to a private mass with the Pope and then meet the Pope afterwards. All right, a golden opportunity which he is not interested in. But sure enough, together with one of the girls in the group, his name gets picked. And he visits the Pope, he sees the Pope, he gets to talk to the Pope, and right, attends the mass, sees the Pope, and an extra, an extra added, he gets to talk to the Pope again a second time. They, they, <coughs> they are called together to the Monsignor, the two, and he talks to the Pope. Now he's on a great high, now he's got to take the train to up to, he's got to get, make his way to Barcelona. He's on his own, completely, 18 years old. And he gets, well, he, first of all, he gets the wrong train because he doesn't speak Italian. So he learns Spanish later on, but he doesn't know it then. But he doesn't speak Italian, gets the wrong train, winds up in Pisa. So there he has to get another train, and he winds up in Nice. But he's on his own, and he gets off the train, and it's like, 1 a.m. say, no, you have to leave the station. You can come back tomorrow, we'll see about getting another train. He has to go into Barcelona. So he's off on his own now. He has to get down off the, off the plateau there in this train station down, and he's, there's these five guys coming at him. Two on one, two count, they split, and they go two on one side of him, two on the other. And here's the free twice in his life, he hears, actually loudly, here's a voice. And this one doesn't say, come follow me, or anything like that. Kind of interesting, it says, Run. So he ran and got away from these guys. Somehow, I forget exactly now how it was, but he got away from them. Actually, he started shouting out to them, leave me alone, leave me alone. He finally said, okay, and they walked away. And somehow he made his, spent his night in Nice there, got back on another train, made his way to Barcelona. And actually, when he got there, his mother wasn't there yet. They had missed their plane, or plane got canceled or whatever, flight got canceled, and they weren't there yet. But anyways, he found out that he was met by, because he got into some trouble there too. In fact, the first thing, he wound up in the plaza there, and in the dark, and he couldn't see, he wound up in a little girl's house. But fortunately, he was all right. They understood. Because he didn't know it until he thought he was in the hotel, and he, when he wakes up the next morning, exhausted, starving, etc., here comes a little girl. A little young old, maybe three-year-old girl, come to him. What are you doing in my house? Anyways, he's there in Spain alone in Barcelona, and finally he meets up with a this tall, six-foot-four black man, all right, 250, 280 pounds. He says, who gives him some? Here, come on, let's go and get you some food. And he gets him some full meal, and sort of takes care of him. And then, okay, bye. It's until later on that he finally his mother gets there. And actually what happened is they go on to Madrid. And now they're, they are in Madrid and he's with his mother and then he gets separated and he winds up in this bar or something. Here comes that black man again. Now here you're on the other side of Spain. You're, well, Madrid's in the middle and Barcelona's to the east. Several thousand miles away. Long way distant. Here's the black man again. And he's about to get in trouble and he takes care of him again. He says, no, you've got to see my mother. I want you to meet my mother. Here comes his mother. So he goes to get his mother, comes back. The black man's gone. He said, and he sees a little letter, God bless, Michael. Apparently, he said, Michael, the archangel, because the guy had vanished. All right. In any case, now, here comes when the second boy comes, many years later, he's finished college, he's graduated, he's living with his friends. And at a certain point, he's decided, they go out one night, and they're in a bar somewhere or something. He's not drinking, but the others are, and they're having their time, and he's saying, wait a minute, I don't want to do this anymore. And he says, I want to go home. And he tells to his friends, well, we're not leaving here. We're not leaving now. We're not going anywhere. So you can walk home. Five miles. So he walked. And he's coming. He comes to, he's in the dark, late at night, early in the morning, I think actually it was like one o'clock in the morning, and he walks by the Newman Club, a Newman Club, and here's where he hears the second voice. Here's where he hears the voice again a second time. It says, go inside. And he's thinking, wait a minute, that place is gonna be locked. How am I gonna go inside? I can't go inside. It's one o'clock in the morning. He starts to walk on, here's the voice again, go inside. And he's thinking, so wait a minute, this is crazy. Can't be, can't be serious. This place is locked, I can't do it. And he starts to again, here's the voice again, very loudly, go inside. Like crazy, it's gonna be locked, but okay. And he walks, it's open, wife walks right in. 
It's the chapel. He's in the chapel. The only light is over the tabernacle. Now he hears the voice. Pick up and read. And that's the same thing St. Augustine heard at his conversion. Pick up and read. And in both cases, sorry. They were called to pick up the Bible. It was the Bible. St. Augustine was told to read from the Romans. But here, when this young lad, Father Joshua Zeltz, Waltz, sorry, anyway, comes, he sees there's the Bible sitting there. And he's thinking, wait a minute, the Bible? Wait, is there anything I don't want to see right now? That's the Bible. But he picks it up. It's open the first chapter of John. Right there sitting in the bench in the pew, already open, and it's open to the first, first chapter of John where... Oh, right, after St. John had, the Baptist had pointed to the first disciples of, of his own disciples. They were two of his own disciples, Andrew and John. Remember the two brothers. James is the brother of John, Peter, Simon and Peter, the brother of Andrew. Anyways, it's Andrew and John, who were disciples of St. John the Baptist, and had pointed out to them. John the Baptist went and taught them, Behold the Lamb of God. So they started to follow our Lord. I mean, literally, they were following behind our Lord, and our Lord turns around and asks them, What do you want? What do you see? Which is something that this, this young man had been asking for some time. Okay, he had another experience where he would feel really great when he was reading about our Lord and thinking about our Lord. Then when he'd go out, it left him. Anyway, so he was seeking, but not very well, right? But he was resisting. And that's what he sees here. What do you seek? And then comes, then they say, well, we'd like to see where you live. I recall that was their response. And our Lord says, come and see. And that's when it all came to Father Walsh, as for he's a priest, of course. There it was. He said he just fell down on his knees and wept for two hours. He had been resisting. He had been pushing back. He was, what it was, he was saying, he was distant from Jesus. He was looking, but he was looking at a distance. And he's saying, no, it's all about living for Jesus, not for myself. He kept going back to himself. That's when he was having fun with his friends or whatever. No, this, that was for myself. I was living for myself, and that's what I was seeking more than anything else. No, it's all living for Jesus. That's what he was seeking. That's what he came to. Him. And so from then on, it, just, it was straightforward right into the seminary and into the priesthood. And he's a priest today. But anyways, the whole thing is living for Jesus, not for myself. Because in the end, I'm in paradise. I'm before our Lord. What's it going to be? I'm going to be for Him. It's all Him. All focused on Him. So the whole thing, even now in this life, that's what we should be seeking, not ourselves. Can't live for myself. If I do that, then I'm resisting the grace. And that's what Father ended by saying in his, in his video last night that I was reading, saying, do those things. Don't never stop going to Mass, never stop going to confession. In fact, in one of his months, he said, now I want you to go every day to Mass. So, well, I, I have to class at eight, how can I do this? Well, there's a 645 Mass. I'm not making that up. A 645 Mass every morning in a certain church. It wasn't here, believe me. But it was in North Dakota, by the way. Anyways, but and you go there every day. Well, it's all right, Father. And tell your friends. To, he was living with his friends, four of them, three of them, I think. Tell them to go. Ask them to go with you every day too. So he, he did. He simply did what he was told. He had that alarm clock set up every morning, five five o'clock, five thirty. Of course, the others are wondering what the heck is going on. There's an alarm going off that early. Well, I'm going to mass. You want to come with me? No. So they didn't come, they never did go with him. But he did actually go to Mass every day. In any case, it's what he was saying, never stop doing those things, and never stop going to confession. And he says, and Christ will work on you. And, and he said, it's a gift. Praise be Jesus and Mary.